Welcome to the White Lake area. Meet our local legislators. I'm Mayor Tom Lohman from the city of Montague. And I'm Steve Salter, Mayor from the city of Whitehall. Joining us today is Senator John Bumstead, Representative Terry Sable, and Representative Greg Van Werken. To our viewers who are live, questions can be submitted through the chats and we'll present them to the legislators as time allows. For those looking at this recording later, you can contact the legislators directly. All right, we're grateful for our legislative guests taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us here today, and uh, we're all interested in hearing what they have to say. I, I feel that uh, a better informed citizens make for a better government, so this legislative panel today is brought to you by Catchmark Technologies, located in beautiful downtown Whitehall, Michigan, and this informative session is sponsored by the White Lake Area Chamber of Commerce with uh, Executive Director Amy Van Loon. Well, Steve, it's time for us to get out of the way and let the panel discussion begin. I hope you enjoy this. Please welcome our panelists, Senator Bumstead, Representative Sabo, and Representative Van Werkham, and moderator Amy Van Loon. Good morning and thank you Mayor Lohman and Mayor Salter for that warm welcome and introduction. I'm Amy Van Loon, the Executive Director of the White Lake Area Chamber of Commerce and I will be moderating today's session. I also want to take this opportunity to welcome our legislative panel as well as our live audience that is joining us. Um, just to reiterate what mayors already had shared, Questions from the viewers uh, can be submitted in the chat box and may be addressed towards the end if the time allows. The legislators contact information is available and it, for additional questions to be made at a later date and time. So please note that this is being recorded so the session may be viewed in the future. So it is my privilege to facilitate today's panel and I'm excited to hear from our legislative guests. Let's go ahead and begin um, with introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about yourself. And we'll start with Senator Bumstead. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, John Bumstead, Senator Bumstead, 34th Senate seat. And uh, actually, the first term is almost up. It's been four years, and it, does, it just time flies. And it's been a real privilege uh, uh, representing Muskegon, Oceana, and Wago County. Uh, you know, I, we, we all serve on a lot of committees, but you know, we focus on the county and uh, all, all three counties. And I sit on appropriations. I'm vice chair of appropriations, Senate appropriations. I chair the DNR budget and Eagle budget, which are very near and dear to my heart as it should be to all of us. It's basically water infrastructure, clean water, parks and recreations. So those are the things we really focus on in our office. And, that's really my passion, working for you in, uh, in, in those fields. So I really appreciate it. Happy to be here today. I'm glad to take any questions from um, folks out there. Great. Thank you, Senator. Representative Sabo. Thanks, Amy. Uh, my name is Terry Sabo. I'm the state representative for the current 92nd district. I'm in my third term already. Uh, time flies, Amy. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it seems like I just got there, and, and here we are already in the third term. But uh, I am a uh, veteran of the United States Air Force. I worked uh, over 25 years for the city of Muskegon Heights between the police and fire departments um, and some other police departments in Muskegon County. And then, uh, and then I was, at one point, I was an, an appointed Muskegon County Road Commissioner and then was elected to the County Commission in 2012. I served two terms there, uh, one of those terms as the chairman of the county board and then went into the state house in 2016, um, which uh, I was very thankful for the voters for putting me there. So I currently serve on the appropriations committee on the house side, 
And uh, I, my, my committees that I'm assigned to or subcommittees are uh, Minority Vice Chair of General Government, and then I also am on the Transportation Subcommittee and the Corrections Subcommittee. And then one of the few uh, Democrats um, to be able to serve on both appropriations and the policy side, I work um, on that policy side on the Workforce, Trades, and Talent Committee. So uh, thanks again for having me here, and um, I look forward to uh, taking on these questions and uh, talking to uh, the people of the area. Thank you. And Representative Van Workum. Thank you, Amy. My name's Representative Greg Van Workum. I am serving in my second term in the legislature. Uh, been around for a long time. Uh, I used to work for two members of Congress. I spent some time in Washington, D.C. working on policy issues, then uh, back home here uh, as a district director for Congressman Bill Heisinga. So I've done a lot of policy work over the years. I currently serve as chair of the General Government Subcommittee on Appropriations, which sounds pretty generic uh, with, as a title, but uh, it's an important committee that deals a lot with the Labor and Economic Opportunity Budget, uh, where you see a lot of workforce training programs as well as uh, the MEDC. Uh, the Department of Technology Management and Budget, which is a lot of the backbone of what goes on in Lansing to make sure the government is actually working for you, uh, and uh, Department of Treasury, and we all know kind of what uh, happens with the Department of Treasury. I also serve on the um, Appropriations Committee for the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, which um, really is kind of what you think of when you think of government and trying to assist people, which takes up a lot of time, a lot of effort, but those are the programs that you're trying to um, uh, help folks uh, make sure that they have a leg up as, uh, as difficult situations occur. Uh, I also serve on the policy committee as minority vice chair of government operations. Uh, a lot of big bills kind of come through there. It's kind of known as the Speaker's Committee. So uh, when uh, some big legislation comes in, uh, we take a look at that. So it's a very busy time, uh, especially around right now, but uh, happy to serve. Uh, my district is the 91st district, which does encompass the city of uh, Whitehall and Montague, as well as uh, White River Township uh, and some surrounding areas. So. Um, Happy to be here. Thank you for pulling this together. Uh, we always enjoy the luncheon, but we want to make sure uh, we get in front of you guys and answer your questions. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. And um, let's go ahead and keep it on you, Representative Van Workum. Uh, you maybe share with us some of the uh, current bills that you're working on or any new proposals. Sure. Thank you. Uh, like I said, I'm chair of the General Government Committee, so that's a pretty big committee in Lansing. Um, I think it's around a third of the budget, uh, and a lot of that is those general fund dollars where you actually have some discretion of, of what you uh, use them on. So that takes up a lot of time, uh, just making sure that we've got government funded. Um, on some of the policy issues, one of the major ones I'm working on is related to work search. I think you're going to hear a little bit about today on unemployment insurance, insurance agencies and the difficult they've had, certainly during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on some legislation that if you are unemployed, now certainly there were some uh, uh, circumstances going on on the past year, two years, but if you are unemployed, we want to make sure you're actually out there uh, looking for work and not just... Um, grabbing the, the, the paycheck. We want to make sure that people are um, uh, making contact with the unemployment agency, working with employers, working with Michigan Works, uh, because there's a need out there right now. Uh, there's a big need for work. Um, I was doing a tour recently of all the restaurants for Restaurant Week in Muskegon, mm. and you just couldn't get in because uh, there wasn't enough workers. There's the demand there. Um, there's enough business there, but we just can't meet that demand because we're having a bit of a labor shortage right now. So we want to make sure people are making that connection out there looking for work. Another one I'm working on is um, an education-related one that deals with coding. Uh, I think it's uh, relevant here at Catchmark and all the technology that they do uh, here in this building. Um, but uh, we want to make coding a part of um, one of the requirements for foreign language uh, in high schools, not a requirement, but an option for kids, uh, not making it mandatory, but having that option. 
uh, with what technology is becoming and part of everyday life. We think um, kids having a knowledge of that uh, and a lot of kids, that's more of their mindset. Uh, it may not be learning French or learning Spanish, but having another opportunity with coding. And it kind of uses the same part of the brain. Uh, it's a lot about problem solving, critical thinking skills, uh, and having an option for that. Um, another one is a, particularly a local issue that we're working on with uh, health policy. So it kind of is a gamut of uh, bigger issues, kind of smaller issues, uh, very local issues. I know I was working on one for uh, the police chief here recently. So um, we want to encourage you, if you've got ideas or having issues with your state government, to, to get in contact with us because that's a lot of what uh, we work on policy-wise. Another passion for me uh, as I got involved was child mental health. And you're hearing a lot more about that in the past uh, year or two, certainly as it relates to the pandemic, um, it's gotten a lot more focus mm -hmm. of, of how our kids are struggling. But when I first took office, spent so much time meeting with superintendents, principals, teachers, doctors, it just mm -hmm. became a, a reoccurring theme of the difficulty students are having uh, right now, particularly on the mental health side. So I've tried to work with our locals on coming up with ideas and strategies uh, to make sure that kids have uh, the resources they need uh, to be successful. Um, whether that's in the school or outside the school, uh, each school has kind of addressed it in its own different way. Um, but I think we need to start really solidifying how we want to approach this as a state to make sure that uh, our kids have the opportunity to succeed uh, and we get that early intervention. Representative Sable, uh, would you be able to share with us um, some of the current bills that you're working on and even any new proposals? Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, I'd be happy to. I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, which right now is, takes up a majority of my time um, when, it become, when it comes to properly appropriating the monies that we have available to us. Um, through not only through additional revenues from the state, but also all of the uh, money that's come from the federal administration uh, that's come down to really help us build, uh, build out in so many different areas of the state. So that has really consumed a lot of time. And uh, because I believe that it's important to uh, get this money properly appropriated <coughs> in these various areas because this is a one-time chance. And uh, we've got to make sure that we're using that money appropriately getting it to uh, the, the areas of need in our state, but also for me personally, it's about making sure that uh, the west side of Michigan um, gets what we have coming. Uh, and what I mean by that is make sure that we're not left out, because many times we're left out when it comes to uh, southeast Michigan uh, and, and whatnot. So um, I've been working closely with a lot of our elected leaders um, and, and other people within the district, trying to find out from them what's important where um, where the need is at and we were very successful um, a couple years ago in getting some of these monies appropriated back to the greater Muskegon area and it's my intent to make sure that we have that uh, happening again this time around um, but uh, so I think we have a, a really it's I want to call it a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really invest in ourselves not only as a state of Michigan but also in the greater Muskegon area which you know I would consider the White Lake area as well um, same type of situation. So a um, couple other things that I've got going on trying to get outside of the budget is uh, uh, Muskegon Family Care in Muskegon. Um, we're working with them on a proposal to try to make sure that they are going to be able to remain solvent to provide health care to those that need those services. That has been a long time problem in the Muskegon area um, with Muskegon Family Care but they've definitely turned the corner with a new administration there and uh, we're looking forward to working with them and, and trying to make sure that they're going to be solvent for a long, long time. Um, but in the past, we've worked with uh, an organization called Access Health. Actually, Representative Van Workman and I worked on this together in, uh, in trying to make sure that, um, once again, people are receiving the health care services that they need, uh, desperately need, and, but also have control over their own destiny when it comes to health care. So it's really a tri-share program, I'll call it where an employer has uh, a part of the burden, the employee has a part of the burden, and then Excess Health picks up another share. Uh, and it's really a good opportunity to keep people um, in the position to have their own health care 
services uh, and keep them off them from uh, the state rolls on that when it comes to that. So um, those are some of the things that I've really uh, tried to focus on is really more about uh, people and what those our people's needs are and, uh, and trying to build relationships. And to me, that is the most important thing that we can do in, uh, in state government is to build those relationships to make sure that we're bring, bringing back the resources necessary back here in, uh, in, our, in our little chunk of the state. So that's, uh, that's what I have, Amy. Excellent. And Senator Bumstead, <laughs> any you, um, new proposals or um, current bills that you're working on? Oh yeah, we are all very busy, but I want everybody to know the priority in our office, as it was when this, my six years in the House, has always been the constituent work. You know, in the Senate, when you represent 260 plus thousand people, the phone rings a lot, especially with the shutdown with the pandemic, unemployment's been a huge issue. Our office, I have five employees, or we have five employees. Every day we get 20, 30, 40, when a pandemic started, hundreds of calls. How do we get our unemployment? We actually, we've become very good experts at that, walking people through the process. Because it's very important, people have money they can pay their bills, pay for their, their food, pay for their clothing, pay for their rent. And uh, those are the issues that are very important. The constituent work is number one in our office, making sure those questions get answered. Sometimes people don't get the exact, exact answers they want, but we want to make sure our office does that. And it's not just unemployment. I mean, it's a, with the shutdowns, it's a lot of it's business issues, it's uh, licensing issues, it's, issues with state departments, DEQ, DNR, you know, there are 17 different departments. Our office is very good at helping people walk through the process and, uh, at the state level. And I think that really is job, our job one in our office is helping people through the process at the state level. And we're very good at it. And have really good staff too. And uh, one of the bills a lot of people know about is Senate Bill 565. It's a water infrastructure bill. We pass it out of the Senate, 330. It's over in the House now. I hope those guys can get it through because it, it really helps uh, the state of Michigan, it helps West Michigan, helps Muskegon, lead line replacement dollars, there's clean water line, uh, uh, clean water uh, money in there. Uh, 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 different municipalities can get into uh, if they need to re revamp their water systems. There's just a lot of good, if you're going to spend ARPA dollars, the f federal dollars, what a better way to spend it than on water infrastructure for our kids and our grandkids down the, you know, for the future. And uh, Senate Bill 565, I encourage everybody to look the, that bill up. Uh, and if you need more help with that, please get contact our office. We will uh, help you through that. Uh, we also have a uh, state parks bill. There's, it's a package of three bills, 702, 703, 704. It will uh, help West Michigan a lot. It, there's, I put $508 million in there. It will max out the state park endowment fund. That way there will always be money in there forever to maintain our state parks. And as living on the West Coast, we all know what our state parks mean to our economy. It's all related. Uh, 704, 703, that bill is to bring up all of our state parks. It spends $250 million right out of the gate to maintain and bring all of our upgrades to all our state parks now. So if we do that, that bill first, then we'll have the money to maintain our state parks forever which is a win-win for all of West Michigan, all the state of Michigan, because the economy, our economy in West Michigan depends on outdoor recreation. Uh, then there's the first bill, 702, that's $150 million for local parks, city, villages, and county parks. It's a grant program. So if we can get those three bills passed, uh, it's gonna benefit West Michigan immensely, especially Muskegon County and the counties along the lake shore. So those are some of the things that we're working on, but. Uh, Basically, I want to let everybody know it's the constituent work that matters to us. All good stuff. Yep. All right. Representative Sabo, Senator mm -hmm. Bumstead already kind of touched on it, but your office gets numerous calls and emails um, from every day to every day, and just when you think you've heard it all, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the common issues, or what are the most common issues that you hear from your constituents? Well, uh, we certainly appreciate any, any call or email that comes into the office. I mean, that's why we're there, is to represent. And, uh, and it, it's always been a focus of mine to make sure that we're doing that to the best of our abilities. And I, I do think that we do a very, very good job when it comes to that. Um, uh, you know, we get, them, we get everything, Amy. I'll tell you what, it, it comes in from, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on about the different ones that we get. Uh, it's amazing. And sometimes they're not even from our own area. 
But, uh, but the biggest thing that we've handled was the unemployment issue. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I want to stress, though, that, you know, it, it was very frustrating. We were all frustrated by it. Um, but I think, you know, this was not a Michigan problem. This was a problem that was going on throughout the country at all of the different states and, and uh, with the unemployment system because it did get overloaded. But quite frankly, though, I think that the system has been changed over the years to really, um, it's not very worker friendly. And um, for these folks that are, were trying to get on through no fault of their own because they lost their employment through no fault of their own, um, and, and the system was just not, not designed to be easy. It was antiquated. Um, it was, we did not invest enough in it um, to prepare us for something like that. But then again, I don't know how you ever could have prepared us because it was such a unique situation with the pandemic going on and so many people going on to the unemployment rolls. But um, that's, uh, that's another thing that I've been working on though in regards to the unemployment is our bills that um, would actually make the system easier to navigate would, uh, would, uh, would have allowed us to do an audit on the system to try to find out where those problems were at. Um, but unfortunately those bills have been just sitting there and we haven't been able to get those moved. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to complain about something, you know, when it's hard to complain about somebody, you know, in a, in a department when, um, uh, you, when you have an opportunity to fix it, but yet you don't take that opportunity. So, uh, you know, that's just, that's just one of the many, many calls and emails that we get, but that was, over the course of the last year or so, that was the number one issue that we got. It was just yep. overwhelming, uh, the, all the calls and emails we got under unemployment. So, mm -hmm. But I, I will end by saying, um, please keep them coming because that's mm -hmm. why we're there. That's why we're there to serve, and we want to try to help out everybody as much as we can. Representative Van Workham, how about your office? What were some of the common issues? Probably yeah, the very I, same story. I think you're going to hear probably the same three answers here. Uh, unemployment just really flooded hmm. the, the calls and continues to be um, a major source of calls. Now you'll get certain bills that are coming up and efforts to uh, advocate for specific bills as, as they come on the floor and things like that, but consistently uh, unemployment and as we run into tax season we'll get some questions yeah. about uh, uh, taxes and needing assistance with with Treasury um, but as uh, representative Sabo was saying yeah it's a lot of um, the individuals that are calling needing help with unemployment but a lot of the calls we were getting certainly at the start of the pandemic was from businesses and um, it's right that it is about relationships and um, a lot of those businesses knew me and would call me personally on my cell phone and asking, am I an essential employee? Are my employees mm -hmm. essential? Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of confusion out there yep. based on a website and um, a frequently asked question. We were running government through a website based on FAQs. And mm -hmm. it was extremely frustrating for everyone. As CDC was saying something, other entity in the federal government was saying something else and then we were putting together, or the governor's office was putting together frequently asked questions and people were trying to figure out how to just keep their employees so that they could continue to have a paycheck and um, so it, it was a it was a difficult time um, for for everyone involved mm -hmm. and um, so it, you know that it was frustrating, but that those were the those were the difficult calls. Uh, I'm thinking of kind of the spring season right now, and all the calls we were getting from the greenhouses mm -hmm. uh, and needing to be open because that's their season. Mm -hmm. If they are not open right now, um, that's 80 percent of of what they do. Um, so a lot of businesses were relying um, on the answers that we could find out for them. Um, further on the unemployment, you know, because it's an opportunity to talk about this, there was an Auditor General report that was done uh, this weekend that was mentioned. And yeah, the system wasn't designed for that kind of flood that came in, um, but there were some poor decisions made. Um, when they were hiring up, they ended up hiring people that had uh, criminal backgrounds on um, money laundering things and those were the ones that were uh, had access to our government system and one employee was uh, busted for stealing 3.8 million dollars from the system 
Um, that's the stuff we're, we're looking at as a committee as we're looking at funding uh, additional dollars for the Attorney General to go after uh, unemployment fraud and the unemployment office is looking for additional dollars. Uh, there were some, some easily avoidable mistakes that were done, uh, even turning off the fraud switch of the system. So um, there was an Auditor General report. We're digging deeper into what was going on in there and I think uh, we'll, we're going to continue to see see more and more of what, what happened and um, that's unfortunate. I mean this was billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars that we likely will never ever see again that just mm -hmm. went out the door for fraud mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we need to do as well as legislators is keep the um, executive branch accountable. Mm -hmm. That's an important mm -hmm. role of the legislature is that oversight role uh, and we'll continue to do that particularly as it relates to unemployment insurance. Yeah. And Senator, you already kind of touched on it, but anything else you'd like to add about yeah. some of the common issues? Yeah, yeah, we, you know, it's, we cover three counties, so the issues are a little more broad. You know, we do a lot of food processing in Oceana and Nuevo counties, and recently they've had a lot of issues with uh, Department of Environmental Quality on, on permitting. So it's, you know, we get a lot of calls with, uh, with complaints on EGLE. And I, luckily, I chair that department. I get along very well with the director. She does a good job. But some, since the pandemic, they've not been working. They've been working from home, not from the mm -hmm. office. So that really sh slows up processing, permitting. They're not working together. So we have to work through all that, that, that process. So it, it really is holding up businesses from wanting to expand. So the quicker we can get over this and move fo forward, the quicker we can get these uh, permits through, uh, in the area uh, you know, processed. Along the lake shore, they're holding up a lot of, uh, DEQ's holding up a lot of construction uh, permitting. In Ocean County, there's a couple processors that want to expand, they just can't get the permitting. So we're involved, our hands are involved with all mm -hmm. of that. And it's just a matter of, they need to get back to work, they need to get working together, they need to get these permits processed ASAP. Because those, those are jobs. Those are jobs we need here in West Michigan, and they're good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to work together to do that. But we also touched on the unemployment. It's, it's just been a mess from day one. Mm -hmm. I think through all of this, it's just hopefully we never ever have to government close down the, the private sector economy again. Mm -hmm. It's been a disaster. It's going to take a long time for businesses to come back, if a lot of them ever do. And uh, we, just, we just can't do this again. We need to, we, we, we're smart enough to figure a way around it to make it work. Certainly some serious um, issues and, and topics that you, you face on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, Terry had kind of you know, pointed out, you know, some off the wall things. Maybe I should have asked, you know, what are some of the most unique or, you know, um, off the wall questions? You probably all could write a book um, <laughs> on, on those answers. Um, shifting a little bit on February 9th, Governor Whitmer released her budget recommendation for 2022 and 2023. Uh, what are a few priorities that you would like to see in the upcoming budget? And I will go ahead and start with Senator Bumstead. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You know, for me, if we're going to spend taxpayers' hard-earned dollars and look, where's the need? It is education. It should be infrastructure, roads, bridges, clean water, those things that are very important. We just need to be very mindful of how we spend those dollars, and what we spend them on and make sure, Representative Sabo said it earlier, make sure we in West Michigan are, are benefit, beneficiaries of some of those dollars in a fair manner. And like he said earlier, it's not been like that throughout the years and we will all make sure and fight for that. Since we all sit on appropriations, it's important. It's, it's actually, we're all sitting in a pretty good spot for that. Mm -hmm. And we just gotta make sure what's in that budget that we can agree with in the House and the Senate and come up with a plan at the end of the day that we can all agree upon that benefits all the taxpayers of the state of Michigan. Spend it wisely, let's not waste it, and how it's gonna be benefit our, our kids and our grandkids in the future. And uh, there's, there's so many different pots of money right now, but there's also a lot of ideas out there on how to spend it. Do we need new programming? It's just there's not enough dollars for all the ideas out there, believe me. Every day our offices get overwhelmed Different groups come in, it's only 5 million, it's 10 million, it's 15 million, it's just, 
where do you draw the line, where's the need. Even though they all could be wonderful programs, there's only so many taxpayer dollars out there, and you, we can't print it at the state level. And we just have to be very uh, mindful on sp and spending our state taxpayers' dollars, because it's your dollars, it's not the government's dollars. And let's be very, very, very frugal with it. Okay. Representative Ben Wickham. Thank you. Um, as I said, I work a lot on uh, labor and economic opportunity um, budget, which is a lot of the workforce training side. Um, Another part of that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure Representative Sabo, since we serve on the same committee, may mention it, but uh, uh, with that is um, uh, the revenue sharing and, and support for uh, cities and locals. One of the things that I've been working on is actually uh, pension related. And we have some underfunded pensions uh, with our cities and locals that is systematic across the state. So I've been working on a plan to try and get them at least to 60%, which doesn't sound like much, but it's that big of an issue um, that, uh, that we're struggling. And ultimately the state is on the hook. So as Senator Bumstead said, the state is actually, I don't know if it's ever been this flush in cash before, uh, which is really a, a dichotomy of where we thought we were gonna be. We probably all thought that this past year we would be cutting budgets, but uh, because of uh, how the economy and frankly uh, unemployment benefits are taxable, uh, so you're getting a lot of money coming into uh, the general fund, uh, we've got dollars that we need to spend. And so what I'm looking at is what are some of these underlying problems that we've uh, faced or are going to continue to face as a state that you can infuse uh, some one-time dollars into there to, to, to set them up for, for success. And one of the ones that just continues to be on the radar is, uh, is that pension liability. And we want to make sure that people are, are made whole and those promises are made, but we also want to make sure that those cities and townships that have done the right thing and have uh, made the adjustments so that they weren't put in situation that they're also um, get a, a benefit as well. So it's kind of a complex issue, but one that I see is, is necessary. But again, I think a lot of it is, what are those one-time investments? And you kind of see this, and I don't want to get into too much Lansing jargon <coughs> here of reoccurring at one time, but a lot of things that you're seeing from the governor's office is claiming that it's one time, but in actuality, it's going to be a situation where you're given those dollars and then there's going to be an expectation of those dollars to continue and continue. And uh, there's an old Reagan saying of uh, there's certainty in, in this world. And one is once you start a government program, it'll continue to be the government program. I did not do uh, President Reagan justice on that, uh, but uh, I think you get my point. So. Um, when we're looking at these dollars, you want to see what are some of these things that are truly one time that can have a big impact uh, for the state and set up the state for, for success um, uh, because those dollars aren't, aren't always going to be there. You're not going to see those federal dollars continue to be there and you're not going to see it continue to be in the, the state coffers. And you also want to see those dollars used for generation because the fact of the matter is the, the federal government doesn't have these dollars to give to the states. Uh, they're borrowing these dollars. So those that are going to end up paying it off over the years is that next generation. Uh, so when the senator says things about uh, infrastructure, I think that's uh, a common uh, between all sides and all uh, uh, in bicameral as well. Um, particularly in, in Muskegon County, as I've done meetings in townships, one of the things that we struggle with is broadband. And we know that broadband and access to high-speed internet can have an, a, 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 a great impact on, on communities um, as people have become more mobile and the pandemic has shown more of uh, the ability to work from home and things like this. Um, that if we can get broadband and put uh, the structure in place and done that appropriately because millions and millions of dollars have been spent on, on broadband, if we can actually come up with a plan that actually works and gets people connected, that could have a major impact for the state of Michigan and its growth over the years. Um, so those are the things. There's a lot of little things in, in the budget. Um, I continue to be a big advocate for uh, childcare 
and my work on the TriShare program that's being used here in Muskegon County. Um, there's efforts to, to try and grow that as well. Um, um, and there's things again on the, the mental health of built or um, uh, having more beds for child mental health um, and, and setting that up and, and redoing uh, some of the state hospitals as it relates to mental health. Those are some critical infrastructure things that will have a, a 30, 40 year impact on the state. And I think those are the things that we need to continue to look at and be focused on. Okay. And Representative Sable. Thank you again. Uh, yeah, the, um, well, I'll just start out by saying, you know, I'm thankful again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for the current federal administration for providing a lot of these dollars back to the state of Michigan so that we can work on a lot of these things. Um, otherwise, it just wouldn't be possible. Um, you know, the senator talked about, you know, his water infrastructure bill and, and those types of things. And so for, we're fortunate to be able to have those types of initiatives uh, because of the, uh, the benefits that have been handed to us from the federal government. And yes, they're gonna ha it's gonna take a while to pay those off, and, and, um, and it certainly is something that is on my mind uh, to, to see how this is playing out and to see how, in fact, it is gonna be paid off. But this is also a once in a lifetime opportunity, and it's an opportunity for us to, to recover from this ongoing pandemic. I think we're in the later stages of that now, and, and it's now it's time to build not only our communities, but our state and our country. And this is a great opportunity to do that. So, um, but moving into the governor's executive recommendation for a state budget, uh, you know, when I looked that over, one of the things that I saw in it was that it helped people. And that's one thing we need right now is for a government to work for the people. And this is a lot of things in there were definitely geared towards that. Um, and many of those issues that she had outlined and made her recommendation on for the budget was, uh, you know, really given, she was given credit for it, uh, for some of those things, not only by, you know, people on the Democratic side of the aisle, but also on the Republican side of the aisle when it comes to the organizations like the chamber groups uh, across the state of Michigan. Um, you know, workers, I mean, there was a lot of things in there that received a lot of bipartisan support. So that's how we're gonna get things done in Lansing. Um, we've seen time and time again where we can sit there and we can argue back and forth about how things are going to be and how things are, how monies are gonna be appropriated, but nothing is gonna get resolved until we all sit down at the table and we all agree that to, to, for some give and take, and make sure that we're satisfying the needs of everybody, not just one political party. So that's, uh, you know, to me, that's my take out of the state budget. Um, and it's something that I'll strive for um, every day as long as I'm in office. Okay. Gentlemen, let's go ahead and pause and let's uh, bring it to our mayors and see if there's any questions that have come in that you would like to field. None yet. Okay, all right. Um, one question that um, was posed and, and had come up uh, earlier is, how do we get the younger people involved in, in government and kind of get them engaged? Um, anybody want to address that? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think it starts at home. You know, I think if your mm. parents, regardless of political party, you know, if you can sit down with your kids and talk about issues how it affects them, how it affects your life, mm -hmm. how it affects your family. I think that's how it should all begin at the family level, at the, at the dinner table, like it used to be years ago. Mm -hmm. And also at the school level. Uh, you know, when I went to school, we always talked social studies, the politics, seems like K through 12 was always there. Government in our senior years, we all took government. And I think some people are more into it than mm -hmm. others, like we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're kind of political junkies here. And uh, I, th I think it does, it starts at the family level, good, clean uh, 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 conversation. I think a lot of it turns young people off today is the, the bickering, the fighting. And I think if you can get away from that, there's nothing wrong with a good political conversation to go head to head on issues, but uh, you don't need to get personal. You don't need to do personal attacks. I think if we could kind of change that and just you know, stick to stick the politics and how it affects you and your family. I think we can get more people involved. But it, um, it does it, to me. It starts at home. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And 
I kind of have a, a piece of that. Uh, a lot of folks that may be watching certainly know, knew my father uh, or know my father. He's still, he's still with us. Um, but uh, that's kind of how I got involved. My dad ran for office uh, in 98 um, and uh, just kind of got engaged and saw that, that process. Uh, I always encourage those that uh, young folks that approach me of how to get involved. It would be a campaign. Um, you kind of just see it, you feel it, and uh, if you can do a campaign, you can kind of do the other stuff. That's uh, that's some of the the intense stuff. But it's also finding an issue that you're passionate about. Um, there's so many school <clears throat> groups that um, start up on on an issue. Uh, I know Amy's a, 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 a Rotarian, just like I am, and Rotaract, and getting kids engaged that way of being part of a, a group. Um, you don't uh, you don't hear about current affairs being taught very much, but uh, that's always. Uh, I wish I would have been engaged more in current affairs when I was in high school, because a lot of these issues just kind of come up again over time whether they were successful or not but understanding that that dynamic of what what is going on at the time and having that historical perspective so staying uh, atop of, of current affairs but uh, it, it's just it's difficult as uh, the senator was saying a lot of people just think it's it's fighting all the time it's bickering and that's what politics is and that's what government is and um, I think between the three of us, we could all uh, come up with probably five, seven different projects that we've all worked on together, being from different sides of the aisle and different sides of the Capitol. Um, because when it comes to Muskegon issues, um, we set a lot of that apart uh, to make sure that uh, it, it, it gets done. Um, and unfortunately, people don't, don't see that part. Uh, they see the stuff that, that bleeds, right? Um, the, 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 the stories in the newspapers, the, what's being shown on the 24-hour news cycle. And I think that's discouraging a lot of young people from getting involved. Um, but um, I, I, I did public service. That's been my, my career because I think it's a noble service. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that gets lost on young people because they just see the politics and the screaming and shouting. But um, it's uh, going into to public service is a, a good cause where you can have a positive impact on, on people's lives. And that's kind of what I've tried to do my career about. And I've chose kind of the government route um, rather than some of the other routes like a teacher or uh, Terry was a police officer and a firefighter. Um, it, it's just another element of public service. And I don't think uh, kids should get discouraged by what they see on TV and maybe uh, do some more following and become a little bit more informed of what it actually is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Amy, uh, my, you know, my take on that is um, we, we definitely need to find a way to do it, to get young people involved because they are the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back in, <clears throat> excuse me, back in uh, 2016 when I first ran for the state house, my core group of volunteers that I had ranged from 23 years old, I think, was the oldest, and the youngest, uh, a couple of them were still in high school yet. I know we did oh. uh, their graduation parties uh, <laughs> during the campaign. So, uh, so we got them involved, and, because, and they were excited to be involved, and I wanted to put them in areas that they felt comfortable with and where they really felt that they could make a difference. And, so we did that, and the ironic thing about that is we had such a, <clears throat> a good core group of young people, and these young people have went on now to become the same group. Uh, one is actually running for my open seat um, that I'll have because of term limits in the state house, but another uh, couple other ones, I've been elected to uh, local school boards. Um, we have one who is an elected township trustee in another township over in mid-Michigan. So these young people really took the bull by the horns and they're doing something with it. They're, they want to make sure that they have a voice. But I really think the number one thing that we can do as adults, not as legislators, but as adults, is stop and shut up and listen. Mm. We need to listen to young people to find out what their issues are and what they want to talk about. 
I think too many times we're busy telling them what they need to be concerned about when in fact we need to be quiet and listen to them and let them tell us what they're concerned about on a daily basis. So that's where, uh, that's where that topic takes me. Okay, thank you. Before we head into any closing remarks, let's go ahead and see if there are any questions from our viewers that the mayors would like to field. Yes, Amy, we do have some questions and let me remind the audience that at the end of this, there will be some contact information. If your questions are not answered, you can certainly contact the legislators directly. Many people would like to recycle. Most of the recycling material has been hauled away to Grand Rapids right now or to Holland. Because of the cost for many of the local haulers have uh, stopped picking up recycling. What can we do to increase the recycling in our area? Hmm. Who would like to field that one first? Well, uh, I know I have worked on uh, this issue, certainly when this first uh, happened about two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, one, we tried or have put up uh, a drop in uh, Cedar Creek area uh, to try and uh, mitigate some of that issues. Um, unfortunately, you know, you kind of got to take a couple steps back on the issue of what happened. It used to be profitable to use uh, recycled materials. And then when, uh, and a lot of that actually was being sent to China. Uh, a lot of those in China basically said, we're not going to accept your um, recyclables anymore. So there was a business argument for, for recycling. And now that's kind of gone away with uh, some world <laughs> dynamics that are playing out that now people are actually feeling and kind of feeling that pinch. So yeah, we, we agree that uh, recycling is popular, but um, on that back end, there was a reason why, or a profitability uh, way to, to make a, a sustainable system where people could do that recycling. So now we're trying to find up with, come up with some alternative ways, of whether it's setting up some drops that uh, help with the economies of scale so that haulers will uh, haul it away and, and use it. Um, so it's not as simple just requiring um, uh, recycling. Uh, there's some back end things of just uh, uh, economic dynamics that uh, are needed to make it a little bit simpler and easier. Mm. Yeah, and if I may, Amy, mm -hmm. I, I just want to add on. I, uh, ex I, I uh, agree with Representative Van Workham in many aspects of that. We, recycling is so important to many of our residents, and we need to find ways to make it easier to do that, but also uh, make it easier for our businesses to do that as well. And one way we can do that is to try to find Michigan people to do these jobs, uh, to, to start these recycling facilities. And let's take care of our own business instead of uh, uh, trying to uh, rely on people from other countries to, to get involved and we have to depend on them to make it all happen. So um, recycling is important. I, I hear about it numerous times um, throughout my, my daily activities and, and that's one of the things that I think we really need to start focusing on as well um, for the overall good of our of our uh, state. Great. Yeah. And we, my turn? Yes, thank you. you. We, you know, we do have some really good uh, recyclers here in Muskegon. The problem is when you have the city of Muskegon is a big metropolitan area, then you have the rural areas, and that's where a lot of the issue comes in. How can we affordably bring in you know, the, the waste, the recyclables from the rural areas? And that's, that's really our dilemma. How do we get it from point A to point D, B at a reasonable cost, and who's gonna pay that cost? Those are the things we have to work through. Because uh, it's different, you know, if you're out 20, 30 miles than it is in the city, it's a little easier in the city to recycle. So, you know, those are the issues we need to work through together. I think we all, who, who doesn't want a clean environment? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all want a clean environment. We all need to recycle. We all need to do the best we can do. And uh, we, we will work to do that. But we, we've got to find a way to make it more efficient. I think that's an example of um, because of, you know, gas prices and a lot of this stuff needs to be hauled, there's going to have to become a different model for how to do it, whether it becomes more centralized or local and how you utilize technology um, to, to make it more affordable and uh, ease of use and less people handling it by the time it gets to its end source. Okay. 
Any additional questions uh, from our viewers? We do have some other questions, but again, it's uh, almost 10.50, about okay. time to wrap up. All right. And again, let me remind the audience that they can submit their questions directly to the legislators, and that will be presented on the screen later. Okay. Very good. Then we will go ahead and go into um, closing remarks, and I will start with Representative Van Workham. Thank you very much. Um, we talked a lot about a lot of different issues today, um, but that's I think shows kind of the importance of, of the work that we're doing. Um, we appreciate you guys putting this on and allowing us to talk a little bit of things uh, that we're working on specifically. Again, you don't necessarily read about that stuff uh, in the papers or see it on the, the news, but it's important work uh, that we're doing to try and help folks, um, especially in this time uh, of, of hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of things have been shifted, but our goal, at least my goal, is to make sure we uh, continue to help those folks uh, try and get back to normal. Uh, whatever whatever that new normal may look like but we want to make sure that uh, businesses are open people are getting those paychecks um, and um, making sure that West Michigan continues to be a great place to live work and raise a family I think that's a lot of reason why all of us got into public service is we want to make our our communities better uh, and trying to figure that out we may have different ideas of how to do that uh, we may have different uh, ideologies uh, of the best way to, to do that but I think in the end uh, that continues to be the goal is how to make this place the place where we want to raise our families and make sure our kids want to raise their families here too so thank you thank you for putting this up great representative Sable well thanks thanks Amy and uh, and thanks again for putting this on I think this is really good I uh, wish we could do more of them actually okay. so uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I really also want to say thank you to my constituents of the 92nd District who have put me where I'm at today. Uh, I am very thankful for that. It's something that to me is very humbling and, uh, and I really appreciate being able to serve you each and every day in Lansing and in, in our community as well. It's something I've always done um, from my military time to my police and fire <coughs> service. Uh, it's always been about serving my community. and. Uh, for me, this is just one another way to be able to do that, and uh, and I, I look at it as uh, you know uh, again I'm, I'm very thankful for it, but I look at it as an opportunity to be just an everyday person. Uh, that's all I have ever been. Um, I've tried to be as an everyday person who's tried to make a living and tried to uh, uh, provide for my family, and um, and I again I just appreciate that opportunity to bring that type of mentality to Lansing to be able to serve my constituents and. Um, you know, when we, when we talk about that, you know, there's, there's times when, and I may not even agree necessarily with an issue, but I know that my constituents certainly are very passionate about a certain issue, and, and that, that's what directs me, is, is what you bring to me uh, to tell me what is important. So please keep contacting my office. Please uh, contact me at the grocery store when you see me, um, and let me know what it is that's important to you, because that's the best way that I can legislate, is when I hear from you. Thank you. Awesome. And Senator Baumstead. Thank you very much. It's been a great venue, Amy. Appreciate it a lot. And I want, also want to thank my constituents of Nuego, Oceana, Muskegon County. And uh, Representative Sable and Van Workham hit it right on the head. We work for you. And our offices work for you. And uh, anytime we can help constituents out with constituent work, it's a great feeling, especially if you can get them the answer that they want. When you hear that from them, you get feedback from them. There's not a better feeling in the world that you're doing the right thing for the constituents of Muskegon County in the 34th Senate seat. So I just want to promise everybody we're going to keep doing that. We're going to work together across the aisle because we, we don't work for just Republicans. Terry doesn't work for just Democrats. We all work for everyone in the county of Muskegon in the 34th Senate seat. It's important we do that. You have to look past the politics. You've got to get things done for constituents and that's what uh, our office will do so thank you right. great great venue thank you well very good this concludes our meet the, our local legislators and thank you again to all of you uh, that participated uh, legislators your time and information is greatly appreciated and um, we are grateful for the work that is being done 
Uh, thank you to our viewers for your interest and for your support and for tuning in first thing on a Monday morning. Um, so with that, uh, we will close and we wish you all a great day. Thank you.